joined us for an ATD Fourth World webinar, Challenge 2015, Towards Sustainable Development That Leaves No One Behind. My name is Ben Faisenfeld. I'm National Director of ATD Fourth World in the United States. And we're pleased to be joined by a few of our colleagues who have worked on the uh, sustainable development participatory research for the Millennium Development Goals. Now, before we start, I wanted to go over a few technical aspects of this webinar. Your microphones are all muted, so uh, only the presenters will be heard right now. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box at the bottom of the GoToMeeting widget. The event is being recorded, and we'll post a recording on our website as soon as it's ready. We'll email you all when the recording is available. And on one last note, at the end of the webinar, we will send out a survey to find out what you thought about the event. It's short. It's only a four-question survey. So please take the time to fill it out and let us know so we can use that to improve future events. So the first person to speak today is Xavier Godino, Research Director for the International Movement ATD Fourth World in the Paris office. And he'll be speaking about participatory research about the Millennium Development Goals and the conclusions of that research. Thank you very much for joining. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this webinar. So I'm going to present the outcomes of a participatory research that we have done with people living in poverty to assess the Millennium Development Goals and to think of recommendations for the post-2015 agenda. So, what role can people in poverty play in ending extreme poverty? This is one of the topics that we addressed and that I will present to you. And through this question, I will present the outcomes of our participatory research. So uh, for the few of you that uh, do not know very well ATD Force World, here is a, a very short presentation of the founder of ATD Force World, Joseph Rezinski who more than 50 years ago contended that extreme poverty is not inevitable. Human beings made it, they can unmake it. This is a great goal. How is it feasible and what role should the poor play? So we have done a participatory research from early 2011 to late 2013 in order to contribute to the evaluation process for the MDGs and to contribute to and to work out recommendations for the post-2015 agenda. This participatory research involved more than 2,000 people from 22 countries, a majority of whom were people living in poverty or in extreme poverty. The final report that we've just published is entitled Challenge 2015, towards sustainable development that leaves no one behind. You can find it on our website and you can down, download it for free. So my presentation, firstly, in my presentation, we firstly describe how extreme poverty severely undermines the efforts and capacities of those who endure it. Secondly, I will explain how taking the poorest as partners and guides is a transformative shift for all. And finally, I will present the five recommendations of our participatory research. First of all, extreme poverty severely undermines the efforts and capacities of those who endure it. Extreme poverty is often trivialized. In fact, it is not just a lack of food, income, housing, and knowledge. People who endure it 
tell us that extreme poverty appears as a harsh violence inflicted upon them. People are looked down and sometimes eliminated. And here is a quote from a mother from Peru. The worst thing about living in extreme poverty is the contempt that they treat you like you are worthless, that they look at you with disgust and fear, and that they even treat you like an enemy. We and our children experience this every day, and it hurts us, humiliates us, and makes us live in fear and shame. The same feature of shame and blame appears in developed and developing countries. Throughout ages, a line of contempt, shame, and even hatred has separated the so-called deserving from the so-called undeserving poor, which often distinguishes poverty from extreme poverty. And we have found out that the fight against extreme poverty often turns into a fight against poor people. In recent years, several heads of state have publicly repented for the barbarity of policies implemented against people in dire poverty, and this is documented in the appendices of our report. A second feature of extreme poverty is that people are made invisible in surveys and statistics. States have failed with the poorest families, said Clara from Spain, who lives in a lorry with her husband and her children. People on low income and social welfare were the hardest hit by austerity policies in Europe. Yet these people, and for example Clara from Spain, these people do not exist in the UN database on global poverty, numbering individuals who live on less than $1.25 a day. In New York, the single town of New York, 1.4 million people rely on food pantries and soup kitchens to eat. So tens of million people are made completely invisible in statistics. In fact, most surveys carried out in rich and poor countries by national or international institutions do not take into account households who are homeless or whose houses are not officially registered, which result in making them invisible in statistics. In Madagascar, we carried out research for the World Bank that demonstrated that 70 people of the 750 people who lived along a dump and scavenge to make a living, were not registered by local authorities. 70% of this group in dire poverty, only 10 kilometers far from the capital, had no official existence, neither for local and national authorities, nor for international development agencies. A third feature is that people are left out by development programs. United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon stated in 2011, it is clear that the MDGs have made a tremendous difference. However, the poorest of the poor are being left behind. In fact, our research demonstrated that development programs most often work against people living in poverty and not for them. We are being demolished, stated participants in one of our seminars, participants coming from South Asia. We are being demolished. Many of the development projects end up displacing thousands of families. These projects aim to rehabilitate railways or develop a business, a shopping center, or something else. But their primary goal is never the well-being or the better being of the affected people. This is what has to change first. And a fourth word delegate from a wealthy European country even stated, people in poverty refuse to be treated as if they were nothing. Many actions and programs concerning the poor turn into oppression for them. 
eventually the identity of people living in poverty are damaged and their fundamental rights are violated. According to the guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights adopted by the Human Rights Council in September 2012, extreme poverty is the combination of income poverty, human development poverty and social exclusion, where a prolonged lack of basic security affects several aspects of people's lives simultaneously, severely compromising their chances of exercising or regaining their rights in the foreseeable future. The accumulation of basic insecurities, when it is chronic, ends up severely impairing people's capacities to exercise their rights. And you may know that Amartya Sen, the Nobel, Nobel Prize of Economy, stated that poverty should be understood as a deprivation of basic capabilities. Now we should take the poorest as partners and guide, and this is a much needed transformative shift. A participant from Burkina Faso stated, even in extreme poverty, a person has ideas. If these ideas aren't recognized, people fall even deeper into poverty. So it's very important to recognize the sinking of people trapped in extreme poverty. Yet, as stated by Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee in their book, Poor Economics, they state that people living in poverty are often reduced to stereotypes in the development discourse and not taken as a source of knowledge, as people to be consulted about what they think or want or do. Taking seriously their experience and knowledge into account leads to a radical rethinking of the way to fight global poverty, which is the undertitle of their book. Yet, merely tapping low-income communities for information constitutes what can be described as extractive research. From the outset, stated participant in, was in a seminar in Mauritius, from the outset, people living in poverty must participate in the conception, decision-making, and the implementation of the project. The project must be designed with them and not for them. It is essential to take time. And we think that a long-term commitment with people in poverty aimed at helping them build their own autonomous knowledge is the only way to avoid extractive research. When we say extractive research, we may uh, we make a comparison with, you know, extractive industries who may exploit natural resources without any benefit for local communities. For many years, we've been experiencing and improving the required conditions to bring to together on an equal footing people in poverty and academics, professionals and community workers so that they can think together. These conditions make up what we call the merging of knowledge methodology. So in our participatory research, we took time to build an autonomous knowledge with people trapped in poverty or in extreme poverty. In each of the countries that took part in investigations, 84th World teams organize weekly or monthly meetings with people living in poverty over periods spanning from 6 to 24 months in order to enable all participants to build an autonomous and collective knowledge and to voice it. But before being able to discuss with partners on an equal footing, low-income individuals and communities who have long been humiliated need time to build self-confidence and trust. They need time to develop a collective understanding of their situation and to construct a sense of agency. Yet this participatory process is a process of empowerment and liberation for all partners. We organize national or international seminars in eight countries with partners who were either NGO representatives or representatives of governments, national governments, or 
international bodies like UNDP, the World Bank, uh, European Union, and so on. Yet, how is a dialogue feasible among actors from such different backgrounds? The success relies partly on the merging of knowledge methodology and mainly on a certain mindset rooted in the belief, confirmed by decades of experience, that it is only by fundamentally changing our relationship to people in poverty that true change will occur. On the one side, people in poverty must gain more self-confidence in their knowledge and capacities. And on the other side, people in power must gain humility and openness about what they do not know. Both sides must learn how to free themselves from the fear that restrains us all to sing together, to live together, and to find a common language. Over years, this process empowers all participants and can even be liberating, as explained Mrs. Mariam from Burkina Faso. She said, I have had many difficulties in my life and I continue to worry about my children and my sister who lives on the streets. But I say that my misery is over. What does that mean? It's because, it's because people I didn't know before, and even those that I did, have become closer to me. That's why I can say that my misery is over. I am now among people. Mrs. Mariam feels freed from the shame that was linked to her situation, and her freedom makes others feel freer too. Now I come to the five recommendations that we made for the post-2015 agenda. The first one is leave no one behind. Leaving no one behind requires eliminating discrimination based on poverty, social origin, gender, or economic status. It also requires aligning development targets and their implementation with human rights norms and standards in keeping with the UN guiding principle on extreme poverty and human rights. The second recommendation is to promote an economy that respects people and the environment. In a world with limited natural resources and rapidly growing inequalities, a profound economic transformation is needed. Full employment and decent work for all should be supported by new investment for the transition to a more ecological economic model including the implementation of social safety nets at national levels in all countries. The third recommendation is to achieve education and training for all based on cooperation, not on competition, among students, teachers, parents, and communities. This cooperation could help adapt the teaching process and course contents to the needs of the entire community, not just of the better of families, and to remove hidden barriers to quality education, like discrimination or additional costs. The fourth recommendation is to promote peace through participatory good governance. We suggest that in all development projects, project directors could appoint individuals who have experience building connections with people living in poverty, conveying the expectations to project leaders and funders is a key element of implementing participation on the ground. All of the above will not be achieved if we fail to introduce people living in poverty as new partners in building knowledge about more sustainable forms of development. Knowledge and development is incomplete and often wrong when it does not incorporate the knowledge of people who are excluded from development. With the adoption by the international community of sustainable development goals for developed and developing countries alike, new indicators of poverty and extreme poverty fitted for all will have to be designed. And we are happy to tell you that the World Bank is interested in working with us on 
complementing the present indicators on poverty and extreme poverty, and we are looking for the right way to do it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to Xavier Godino, Research Director of ATD Fourth World Movement International, the Paris office. And just as a reminder, if any questions come up while you guys are listening to this, you can put those in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And you can select that they will be going to Dave Meyer, the organizer of this call. Um, and next, we'd like to welcome Guillaume Charvon, who was the national coordinator for ATD Fourth World in Burkina Faso and helped to coordinate the participation of Burkina Faso in this research. Good afternoon. I am very pleased to be with you in this webinar. Today, I'm going to present the work made by ATD Force World in Burkina Faso in the context of the energy evaluation. Muted. In this country, an action research project was carried out over a period of 18 months. During this time, and with a background of 30 years of experience in Burkina Faso, we try to understand, with people living in poverty, what is the meaning of education, education for all. 335 men, women, and children in urban and rural settings across Burkina Faso were involved in this research. Together, we try to think about what knowledge do we need to build a future for everyone? We finished to build and share our understanding during an international seminar that took place in Ouagadougou. Participants were drawn from very different backgrounds and with different family, professional or institutional responsibilities. The majority of these participants face hardship on a daily basis. The others were researchers, professors, and school directors, delegates from UNICEF and from different ministries and nonprofits. As a result of the action research, we were all working together as partners. About the context, there are three facts that show how Burkina Faso is a challenging country. It is a sub-Saharan West African country where the population faces a generalized precariousness of life in terms of health, nutrition, access to water, and education. Its landlocked position means that the country is also vulnerable to economic shocks, such as sudden hikes in food prices, which limit access to affordable food for the vast majority of people. The United Nations Human Development Index classifies Burkina Faso as 183 out of 187 countries globally in 2013. Education, a meeting point or a trouble spot. Within two or three generations, Burkina Faso society has seen itself caught between two worlds, an, agra an agrarian way of life and urban life offering alternatives to the scarcity of arable land and to which are attached certain ideas of social and economic success and well-being, such as access to electricity, running water, among others. Education is where these two worlds meet and get in trouble, the one with the other. As the father said, children who go to school don't know how to grow things anymore, and there aren't enough offices for everyone, 
So what are we going to do? People living in poor communities understand how school could be a chance, but they know it can be a trap too. They face great challenges and they can't make the wrong choice without hard consequences on their daily life. So they develop an understanding of the world, of the society, of themselves, which helps them to make choices. What is this understanding? How do these people decide about something as important as the future of their children? After years of daily living with people excluded from the mainstream, Atelier Force World felt the necessity to work on a deep contradiction. The formal education system requires parents to invest a lot in the formal education of their children. But the conflict generated inside the community and the families by this new form of education is not balanced by real work possibilities and social mobility for their children. In Burkina Faso, the work on this evaluation took place in Atelier Force World's courtyard, where a sculpture proclaims, may the person who thinks he does not know become the teacher of the one who thinks he does. This approach creates conditions where each person can look at their own life experience to see how it resonates with the experience of others. It was a way to build a collective understanding of what works and what does not, and to sharpen our vision of what may be possible in the future. The learning process was led by the merging knowledge methodology that developed step by step a way to think together between people with very various backgrounds, inequality, and reciprocity. The merging knowledge methodology produced empowerment to all the participants. Mr. Alexandre is one of the people who contributes to our evaluation. As a child, he lived in the streets, and his life is still very hard. Regarding this evaluation, he said, what we've done here together is wonderful. It's understanding life that makes it possible to change it. Mariam, a young mother, had, I could declare that my misery is over. When I say my, miser my misery is over, what does that mean? It's, it's because people I didn't know before, and even those that I did, have become closer to me. That's why I can say that my misery is over. I am no among people. Researchers from the universities who participate in this process of understanding knowledge also question their own responsibilities concerning this quest for education for all. As Ellen Chase from Oxford University explained, a major challenge for us is to think about how we can work better with people living in extreme poverty across the world so that they discover and voice their own solutions. The emerging knowledge methodology is still experiment, experimented by in different contexts by the first world movement, even here in the US in partnership, in partnership with UMass Boston. On the contents, we learned together that people in under-resourced communities make choices that maximize their chance for a better future, but it's a gamble. Within the same family, some will go to school while others will stay and learn about agricultural and pastoral life. Since success is understood collectively rather than on, a, than on an individual basis, the chances of success for the world family are increased through the diversity. Does it make sense, therefore, to choose a single pathway towards success for all while the future of the world community depends on it? Of my nine children, two are going to school. The girls are going to learn about morally acceptable. Why should some have the chance to go to school and not others? Each logic drawing its reference from its own value system. And this system being exclusive of each other, 
there is no real meeting point through which one word can influence, can influence the other. And value systems that does not meet tend to become value systems that are judgmental, judgmental of each other's. Each other. The action research and the seminar generated some consensus about the meaning of educational success. Success in education is firstly the expression of basic values. It is solidarity. We learned that by seeing this dad. He lived in Biggie. He lived by begging. But when one of his friend's children came back from school without having eaten, he took 100 francs out of his box to give him, without knowing if he would have enough for his own child. It is dignity. My friends tell, tell me to come and hit at their house, but I tell them that I, I've already eaten. If I told them I was hungry, it wouldn't be respectful to my father. It is respect, pardon, humility, and courage. Without courage, I wouldn't be able to do anything today, and someone dead will do better than me. Educational success was also defined in terms of becoming useful to self, family, community, and society as a whole. Knowledge makes sense when it creates cohesion within a community around a set of shared values. However, the achievement of this shared vision of educational success was thought to be constantly challenged by the evolution of modern society and by the daily constraints imposed by extreme poverty. Factors that prevent educational success are absence of birth certificates, overcrowded classes and demotivated teachers, the irrelevance of the school curricula and the hidden cost of education, discrimination, humiliation, mockery and violence. They told me at school that I will never have my certificate because my father is poor. He hunts the public toilets he makes ropes in order to sell them. And there is anger. You get up, you have eaten nothing. You leave for school with a crumping stomach. I think it is the effort of our parents that are in our hearts. Our parents before are like a meal. It was like it was that which filled our stomachs so that we could carry on. The wider question concerning what education for all means in a country like Burkina Faso is illustrated by the following quote from one participant in the research. If educational success is to work in office or be a politician, I can say that among the poor, those who succeed are very few. That is why so many families living in poverty stop sending their children to school. That is why I suggest that at school, they also teach children training how to do things. If they did that, then we could believe that school is for everyone. For researchers and universities, they learned that the concept of education has to be expanded to include work on understanding conceptualization of basic knowledge and what constitutes educational success. We all agreed that traditional knowledge and specialized knowledge should complement each other to implement a future for everyone. And to conclude, we can say that education clearly has a potential to help of alleviating extreme poverty in countries such as Burkina Faso in economic, social, and political terms. Equally, it can play a significant role in reducing social marginalization, giving people greater control over their lives and sustaining a system of good governance. However, the capacity of education to enhance economic, social, and human capital is contingent on education system being relevant and appropriate to the context in which they are designed and implemented. Understanding where formal educational provision Unmuted. fits within the wider context of children and young people's lives, recognizing the importance of the learning that takes place outside of as well as within the school context, 
and being cognizant of the cultural norms, values, and expectations of parents in the wider community are all vital in creating educational provision which supports economic, social, and human development. Such, under such under understanding comes from a continuous process of dialogue, interaction, and mutual learning between the formal education system and the wider communities they are intended to serve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Guillaume Charbon. Now we're going to hear from Fabio Palacio, who is an advocacy associate at the United Nations in ATD Fourth World. We'll be talking more about our work at the United Nations to make the results of our research a reality. Thank you, Ben. My name is Fabio. Um, so first, I'm just going to lay out a little bit of the structure of the team in New York. Uh, our UN advocacy team is comprised of two representatives, Christina Diaz and myself. And it's not just us two that represent the UN. Well, we represent the UN, but we take in a lot of consultation, a lot of knowledge and strategy from the rest of our international team, which comprises people who do advocacy at various other international institutions, such as the Geneva branch of the UN. Uh, we also have local teams around the world uh, that feed in information and ideas as to how to perform better advocacy. We also perform advocacy at a regional level, and we consult with the people that do this as well. Now, the objectives of our team in specific are, to, are twofold. First of all, is content to influence development policy at the United Nations, particularly at this moment we're focusing on post-2015. And I'll talk later on about this, but we tried to make sure that our proposals and the way we, we shift policy or we try to shift policy reflects the findings of our participatory research. Uh, and secondly, as Xavier explained, we don't, at ATD Fourth World, we, our primary, our concern isn't only content and bringing out this knowledge, but also making sure that it's done the right way. And this is reflected in our work at the United Nations, where our priority, where one of our priorities is also changing process. The way we, we build policy, the way we conduct debate, the way, how inclusive every, uh, all of our structures are. So what's our method? Uh, our method has four main components. We perform policy analysis using the research that we've done, speaking with our teams themselves, uh, feeding in information from all our different entities, and also doing research uh, at our offices in New York. We leverage partnerships throughout the UN network uh, to strengthen our proposals and to disseminate information. Uh, we participate and organize activities uh, where we can present our findings and present our proposals and also bring in people living in poverty themselves to speak on their own behalf. Uh, this is a, a way that we try to bring to bring to the UN this new these new processes that we think uh, should be adopted at the international level. Finally, uh, something that all of us who perform advocacy know is extremely important is direct advocacy and relationship building with uh, decision makers. Uh, in our case, at the United Nations, decision makers are member states and their representatives, uh, UN agencies who feed in uh, a lot of a lot of information and advice to these member states. And so, we really try to cultivate personal, individual relationships through through which we can uh, pass on our ideas. If you if you go to our website, and I'm sure there'll be links uh, later on or in the emails that we send out. Uh, you will see, you can, you can find the different policy papers that we've written. All the policy papers have, have been created through a two-fold process. First of all, we take the proposals of the research that Xavier presented, and we compare them to the language that exists at the UN. And there has to be a translation process between the language of participatory research and the language of policy. And we, we tried to hold true to the uh, proposals of the participatory research, and Xavier would tell us whether or not he agrees with uh, our integrity, but I think we've done a pretty good job, and you can see for yourself on, on the uh, position papers how well we reflect the findings, and also I guess you'd have to read the report, which is probably a good idea anyways. We also have a policy brief on CBDR, um, Common but Differentiated Responsibilities, 
uh, because we think it's good, it's it has become a critical issue at the UN, and we wanted to weigh in a little bit on it. Uh, some of the partnerships that we have at the UN uh, include various NGO committees, the NGO Committee for Social Development, uh, the NGO Committee for the Eradication of Poverty, and the NGO Committee on UNICEF. Through these committees, we try to organize advo joint advocacy efforts, um, coordinate policy proposals, and organize events. Uh, also, for example, the Baha'i International Community uh, is, a, is another organization that with whom we've partnered for a very long time uh, with breakfast, uh, morning breakfast dialogues where uh, we discuss policy proposals and ideas that are particularly important for post-2015. And I'll discuss those further in the next few slides. And secondly, we are also uh, heavily engaged with UNICEF's post-2015 unit with whom we're organizing a different kind of dialogue that I'll talk about now. So the monthly breakfast dialogues below you can see a picture of what it looks like. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, event that has actually proved to be pretty well received at the at the UN found at the UN family in New York. Uh, these breakfast dialogues we've had 19 so far, and they they seek to discuss in an inclusive manner uh, some of the, some of the ideas that are important right now uh, in post 2015. Uh, the the reason we find them particularly innovative is because of the kinds of discussion that we have. The discussion is intentionally very informal. It, uh, it, it operates, operates under the Chatham House rule, which means that no, none, of the speak, none of the ideas uh, put forth can be attributed to the speaker or their organization. Uh, and the diversity of people who come is also pretty, pretty remarkable. We always have a pretty good distribution of NGOs and civil society organizations, UN agencies, and member states. And they speak on a pretty equal footing. And we believe that this is a kind of process, is a kind of methodology that should be adopted throughout the UN system and other institutions. Another interesting uh, event that we've been organizing, oh, so those monthly breakfast dialogues have been organized with Baha'i and they are held at their, at their offices. The next uh, event that I wanted to discuss was uh, originally focused Skype dialogues. Uh, we've had one so far organized with UNICEF uh, where we help prepare a, de a delegation from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, who has been engaged in participatory research for a long time through ATD Fourth World and the Center for Social Policy at UMass uh, Boston. And through Skype, they were able to have a conversation with representatives from various organizations at the UN. Uh, in this case, it was the permanent mission of the United, United States, uh, Denmark, and um, uh, and then there was also representatives from UNICEF and the PGA. And through these conversations, they were able to discuss some of the things that people living in poverty in Boston find particularly important. In this case, they spoke a lot about social protection, discrimination, access to services. And we were able to really focus on some important uh, factors for these for people living in poverty and how pe how people at the UN could help change these things. We also organize side events whenever we can. Uh, our most recent one was during the Commission for Social Development and it focused on shame and other qualitative issues related to social exclusion and how to measure them. Uh, it was a very interesting event, and we had a person living in poverty explain how discrimination and social exclusion affects not only the quality of her own life, but also the quality of the social programs that are organized for her benefit. Uh, finally, whenever we get the chance, we try to create speaking opportunities for people living in poverty to speak for themselves. Far too often, we have conversations where we discuss issues that are most familiar to people living in poverty, and we assume that we have the expertise to speak about it without them there. But it seems to, to us at ATD Fourth World that the knowledge held by people who actually experience these things that we discuss is extremely important and wasted on a regular basis. So again, these are opportunities and these events are opportunities to not only bring forth content, most of which comes from participatory research, but also to demonstrate how process can be different at the UN and other international institutions. 
Uh, there's not much to say about direct advocacy. A lot of us who perform advocacy understand what it means. Uh, we have on a regular basis we meet with with delegations. We have uh, informal conversations, and we try to present them our ideas and our proposals. The stronger these relationships are, the better the more the better accepted our proposals can be. Uh, when sometimes we even get lucky enough to. Uh, pass on some specific language for a resolution and see it proposed by the delegates in, in negotiations. Again, this requires uh, intensive relationship building, trust building, um, and it requires that we have good language readily available to propose on specific um, resolutions. Now, for the next two slides, I'll discuss some of our some of our priorities right now. First, I'll talk about specific policy, and then I'll sp uh, talk about some target um, areas within the UN system that we're focusing on. So, when it comes to policy, one of our one of the best proposals that we that we've been pushing is specific language. It says no target should be considered achieved unless it is met at the lowest income quintile. As many of you know, this was found at the high level panel. Uh, the high level panel of eminent persons on post 2015 and it's also in one of our position papers and we will be discuss and, and we've been pushing it a lot and we found that many member states are speaking about it now and it's very related to another topic that we think is very important which is disaggregation not only by income but by other uh, marginalizing factors uh, and we believe that no target should be considered accomplished until it reaches all the relevant social groups. And there's a lot of research out there done on this particular issue, not only through the participatory research that we did, but also with the work of Katerina de Albuquerque, special rapporteur on the right to safe drinking water, uh, explains in her own research that too far too often development projects increase access for the easiest to reach. So the middle classes, the middle income, the middle of the income distribution, but leaves the lowest income quintiles and the lowest deciles untouched. Uh, and not only does this decrease the effectiveness of policy, it also increases inequality at the low, at the bottom end of the distribution. Next, social protection floors have become uh, a very popular idea, and it's something that we think is particularly important for not only maintaining economic development, but also securing human rights for all. Uh, social protection floors have, are, are being pushed at all at, uh, by all of our teams around the world, and also uh, by the Global Coalition on Social Protection Floors, th uh, with wh whom we're very active. Uh, next, uh, and something that comes up in participatory research is the multidimensionality of poverty. Poverty measured simply by income, uh, as many civil society organizations agree, is uh, a really incomplete measurement of poverty. And so by pushing and by suggesting and proposing uh, multidimensional measures, uh, we're, we're trying to expand this definition. Uh, you've, we have seen at the United Nations, uh, at the Sustainable Solutions Development, uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, um, the idea of extreme poverty in all its forms, uh, which is another idea that, that we think is very interesting as a way to include uh, different kinds of poverty, different elements of poverty into the measurements that that we use for monitoring progress. And again, here at the World at the World Bank is what we're trying to achieve, trying to open up these uh, large institutions that dominate how we measure progress and open them up to new measures, uh, particularly qualitative measures that can, can, that, can, that can grasp issues like social exclusion, discrimination, isolation, and shame. Finally, implementing a rights-based approach to development. And it, we, this is one of our most worrisome areas because we see that rights as an issue is being uh, marginalized in the post-2015 development agenda. Uh, as, as you might expect, we think rights are one of the strongest ways by which we can secure some of these economic issues that we're trying to push on a regular basis through post-2015. Uh, but at the same time, this strength is also uh, what makes it so hard to to uh, disseminate and to popularize. But we we're keeping that up, and the NGO Committee on Social Development in particular is going to be more active uh, in the next few months in securing this rights-based approach. Now, the rights-based approach 
And maybe I'll talk about this. Yeah, I'll talk about this in the next slide. Uh, and then finally, before I move on to the next slide, uh, there's participation. And I know there's somebody from Participate here on the on the call. And it's definitely a priority as, as we've demonstrated through our events and our, and our constant um, emphasis on participation. But we're, we have trouble finding ways to propose participation in language that leads to measurable targets. Uh, we're still doing research on this and we're still open to ideas. Uh, and we're still suggesting that it's included in narratives, but we understand that uh, as a target, it would be very hard to translate. But again, we are, we're open to as many ideas as possible on how we can propose this in measurable language. But there is language for narratives, for example, including people living in poverty in design, implementation, monitoring, and, evalu and evaluation of development programs that affect them. Now, this is my last slide. Uh, and it's just to demonstrate where we're trying to bring some of these ideas of, uh, uh, that, that I just proposed. So obviously, the open working group on the SDGs is uh, the most active body and where we're most active right now uh, on post-2015. Um, now, the, the next issue on here on the slide is rights versus economic development, which I already spoke to uh, in my previous slide. Uh, but it's an emerging issue, and we're seeing a more, clearly, uh, more clear dichotomy between those who believe that this agenda should be only about economic development and those who think that rights are an integral part of economic development. Of course, at ATD Fourth World, we believe that rights and economic and, and, and economic social rights and cultural rights are part of economic rights, and they're in, inalienable and um, indivisible. Uh, another particular area where we're interested right now is uh, the PGA special events uh, and interactive debates uh, on uh, with something they call setting the stage. We've been advocating strongly for them to include more people living in poverty in all of these events. Um, and so we'll see how we can do, how we do in this, but we would love the support of all the people listening here to um, increase lobbying and advocacy on behalf of people living in poverty, not to bring forth their ideas uh, on, their, uh, on their behalf, but rather to have them in the room themselves speaking on their own behalf. Uh, the dialogue events that I mentioned earlier on Skype with UNICEF or um, at Baha'i uh, with, with, uh, with their support are also things that we think can really revolutionize the way we, we build policy at the UN. And finally, measurement. And uh, I already spoke about disaggregation and multidimensionality uh, and qualitative data and participatory research and, partic and participatory, uh, yeah, participatory research. But I wanted to touch a little bit about this rights-based approach and the human rights uh, based approach specifically, and how it relates to measurement. We talk a lot about, and there's a lot of civil society organizations that say as one of their buzzwords, a human rights-based approach. But what does that mean? Even many member states don't really understand what we mean when we say that. How does it translate to targets and goals? And it's important that we find indicators that represent human rights or that can deem human rights uh, measurable or else this rhetoric is going to be lost in the actual agenda. Uh, the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights has an interesting report on human rights indicators that I recommend people read. And these are some of the indicators that you'll find in our policy uh, papers as well. Uh, I look forward to any of your comments and feedback. Uh, and I'll pass it back over to Ben or Dave. All right, Fabio, we had one question that came in for you. Um, actually, a couple of questions. The first was, on the last slide, you had mentioned PGA's methodology, and just a clarification question, what PGA means? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, the PGA is the president of the General Assembly, and he has been organizing in parallel to the post-2015 uh, development agenda negotiation processes, uh, his own events that should complement some of these conversations that are going on in post-2015. And they have their own agenda, their own concept papers, uh, and we just... We've been tr really trying to get people living in poverty to participate in those more actively. And we have two more questions. One is also for Fabio. Fabio, if you could explain a little bit more uh, the meaning of, of the phrase decreasing the intensity of poverty, if that refers to. Yes, we like this definition, this language a lot, because it's more in line with the ATD fourth world definition of extreme poverty. 
uh, as Xavier mentioned in his definition, uh, it, the way we conceptualize extreme poverty is a is a overlapping of deprivations and how this overlapping can make it harder to regain your rights. Now, the way the uh, multidimensional poverty index works is it measures how 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 many concurrent deprivations a person experiences or household experiences. And depending on this number of overlapping deprivations, that's how they calculate the intensity of poverty. Um, and we like this, and we like this, and we think that decreasing this intensity is more in line with how we conceptualize uh, extreme poverty. Additionally, I should add that the MPI, the currently, the current, the existing MPI doesn't have social indicators like social exclusion or ways to measure uh, discrimination. But that's also lobbying that we're doing to try to inc increase or include qualitative measures like those into the MPIs of the future. All right, thank you very much, Fabio. We had another question that came in from Erica at Participate in the UK. She said that Participate works very closely with ATD in Latin America, and ATD was part of their participatory <coughs> research group. So she knows about the work that ATD Fourth World does with people in extreme poverty. But how do we work with those in power? How do we change their mindsets? It's a major challenge to bridge the gap, but most times policymakers and academics are not are the ones that won't change themselves. So this question we're going to give to Xavier Godino. Yes, thank you for <clears throat> putting this question. I would say, how do we try to change the mindset of people who have power? Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, to recall uh, what the founder of ATD Fourth World, Joseph Renansky, used to say. He used to say, we have no enemy to kill. We only have friends to win. And this is how we, we are trying to, you know, to work. I, I would say that the first way to try and change the mindset of people in, in power is to challenge them. And I would like to give an example, uh, which is underway. It is how we try uh, and work with, uh, with the World Bank. So we try to challenge the way knowledge is built within the World Bank. For example, as you may have seen uh, in the PowerPoint presentation, for example, about statistics, because we, we demonstrate that uh, statistics that are published by United Nations and the World Bank make uh, a lot of people living in poverty invisible. So th this challenges the way uh, they work out statistics. Um, another, <clears throat> another way to, to challenge them is about uh, the definition of extreme poverty. When you define extreme poverty by the $1.25 a day measurement, uh, we say that it's very simplistic and uh, extreme poverty is much more complex than uh, one dimension uh, monetary measurement of poverty. It's multidimensional and it includes also a dimension of social exclusion, dimension of isolation, a dimension of, you know, we, share, we said the dimension of shame. And this is not captured by uh, this definition of uh, the, the World Bank definition of extreme poverty. And so we challenge them on this definition. And uh, we offer to collaborate with them. We do not only challenge them. We say, well, we, we, we would like to work with you and try and find with you uh, a more uh, accurate definition of extreme poverty and a more uh, accurate way of uh, building up knowledge on extreme poverty. Uh, we offer them to collaborate with them and we offer them also, I would say, to support us because we, we you know, many relationships with people uh, within the World Bank staff, we find uh, people who are really receptive and who would like to support us. And so we, we have to find the ways they can support us. And we also think we must give them the chance 
uh, at a point to meet with people in extreme poverty and to find out that they really uh, have a thinking which is of interest, that they really have ideas of, of course, what extreme poverty is, but also they have ideas on how to fight it, uh, what is requested to, to put an end to extreme poverty. I must add that in the way to challenge people in power, we very often refer them to their own mission and ideal. For example, the mission of the World Bank is to end extreme poverty. It's written here on the walls, and they, they have adopted a new, uh, a new goal, which is to promote shared prosperity and economic inclusion. So what is economic inclusion? How do you define it? Uh, and we contend that you cannot define properly what is economic inclusion if you do not take into account the knowledge of people who are excluded from economic development. If you do not take their knowledge into account, your knowledge will be insufficient or even wrong. So we offer to collaborate with them to complement uh, their knowledge with the knowledge coming from uh, people who have the experience of poverty and coming from people who are uh, committed with people living in extreme poverty. Uh, and once again, we, we want to give them the chance to, to meet with people trapped in extreme poverty and to dialogue with them on an equal footing, which is also a, a, another challenge. And I will end up uh, by uh, <clears throat> explaining that this takes time and we need to, you know, to to have an approach of people uh, in power, a long-term approach with them. If we want to, you know, to influence people and to influence institutions, we need to take time with them exactly as we need to take time with people uh, experiencing poverty to empower them. We're going to thank Xavier Godino, Fabio Palacio, and Guillaume Charvon for sharing with us this afternoon. And as you can see on your screen, the MDG report is available for download. And we would invite everyone to please take a short survey to give feedback about this webinar. And also look at the fourthworldmovement.org slash UN website for more information on our advocacy work at the United Nations. Thank you very much for joining us. And this concludes our webinar. Mm -hmm.